Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Wiscombe. I'm chair of the undergraduate program here at SciArc, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Imhoff. Um, so Barbara um, hails from Vienna, Austria, and her office is called Liquifier Systems Group, and it's a multidisciplinary organization focused on humans in space Thinking about humans might sur survive on long duration travel um, to Mars or the moon or otherwise. And, um, and also in closed loop systems, which uh, you all know have to do with uh, surviving in a bubble. Um, she originally studied in uh, architecture with Wolf Pricks in the Pricks master class and graduated in 1996. And then went on to earn a master, and I love this, a master in space studies at the International Space University in Strasbourg. Uh, which sounds fake, but I, it's clearly not fake. I love it. Uh, uh, followed by a PhD at the TU in Vienna uh, on long duration space uh, missions to Mars. She refers to herself as a space architect. Um, so <clears throat> I just have a few, a few thoughts here um, before we get going here, Barbara. So um, the name of Barbara's lecture tonight is The Stars Look Very Different Today. Um, I like this title because it makes me think of the arc of the Grand Apollo space program of the 60s and 70s <laughs> and the vision of space we had at that time compared to today. At that time, space was a frontier, a political race to extend sovereignty and technological might, but also a source of enchantment. The Saturn V mega rocket, the lunar lander, Cape Canaveral, even the individual astronauts themselves were magical objects and their political directives somehow paled in comparison to the dreamy out reality their existence constructed. Did you know that we soft landed humans on the moon six times between 1969 and 1972? So it wasn't just the main moon mission, Apollo 11. Um, it's hard to remember that fact because it's, almost it's an almost unnecessary technical epilogue to a primary narrative of human wonder and expansion. And don't forget that this was the time of Richard Nixon when he was approving B-52 carpet bombing of North Vietnam and Cambodia. It was our space ethics that saved us in a way. <laughs> now, Today, after a kind of dark ages of space where not much happened for over two decades except rote space shuttle cargo trips, space has been reanimated as a new kind of public-private enterprise. Those Apollo mission stories of grand exploration feel sentimental and less relevant now. This new space project is more like hardcore speculative realist science fiction. Note that the dark ages of space occurred in parallel with the rise of science fiction writers like William Gibson and Neal Stephenson, who deal in forms of societal decadence like privatization of the public realm, technological espionage, and alteration of the human body, signaling the decline of civilization building dramas of Heinlein and Asimov before them. It's as if literature anticipated this shift, laying the groundwork for a new space mission with radically different social and aesthetic values. Now, we have Elon Musk building a for-profit mega business empire that he insists has one reason for existing, and that is to save the human race by dividing it onto two planets, Earth and Mars, thereby exponentially increasing our chances of survival. Some days, though, it seems like all of that might be a fabrication, and that he did it to create the Instagram story of Starman in his Tesla Roadster launching into space on Falcon Heavy. He trades in speculation like the great industrialists of the 20th century, but also takes full advantage of a contemporary world that is amenable to factual elasticity. Then we have the recent Chinese Chang'e 4 trip out to the dark side of the moon, which seems almost a pair of fictional enterprise. We can imagine all kinds of dark science fiction discoveries and intrigue related to this dark side landing, to the point where we hardly care that it is in fact not dark at all, but just invisible to humans. It's illuminated back there. And while I'm sure there is legit science to be done on the dark side, isn't it actually more likely that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are in league with a specter-like organization and that they are building a base there for their satellite killer laser super weapons and counter space technologies? 
CNN literally just reported that yesterday. <laughs> Luckily, we have dark comedians like Stephen Colbert who check our facts real time. Otherwise, we would certainly lose our grip on reality in this new era of space. <sighs> Anyway, um, as you see, I just wanted to point out a few important moments in the history of space travel, which have been memorialized here in models. As we all know, models accurately show us the history of technology and human achievement confirmed by the fact they are manufactured in strict scale. Here's one final model I wanted to show you from Cole Pimmelblau, manufactured at 1 to 50 metric scale. It's, it is evidence of the first Austrian space revolution in 1968, one year before Apollo 11 hit the moon. While it is proposed on Earth, it is clearly a speculative space project, somehow still relevant in a time of global catastrophe and ideological bubbles. So with that, let's see how Barbara Imhoff defines the second great Austrian space revolution. Thank you. Thank you for this fantastic introduction. Um, and um, I'll change the slides here. <coughs> Good, thank you. I don't, I can't see the mouse. So the last slide, um, The Cloud by Kopp Himmelblau, was actually um, conceived in 1968, which is um, the same year uh, David Bowie wrote the song um, to Space Oddity, The Stars Look Very Different Today. And um, Yeah, this is, um, it feels like space flight. You always have to solve technical problems. So um, I, like, um, I, I, I like music as everybody does and I also like to look at the lyrics. So that's why I, I'm, um, my favorite um, lecture titles are taglines uh, from um, music uh, lyrics. The Stars Look Different Today um, is um, also when you look up into space and, um, or into the skies at night, you'll see that it's very different from what it was back then, um, 50, more than 50 years ago. We can see uh, today that um, there are a lot of satellites. There are more than 5,000 satellites uh, circling the orbit. Um, and so Earth got extended uh, in a major way through a technological ring of um, observation instruments which are continuously circling. And one of the brightest and greatest satellite is the International Space Station. And you can see the uh, space station as a kind of blinking, twinkling star with your naked eye when you look up and you're uh, at the right spot at the right time. The International Space Station is also interesting because it's very close. When you consider driving um, to Las Vegas, which is 270 miles away, then after two thirds, if you just would change your orientation and direction and would leave the um, X and Y plane and just go upright into you know, the Z axis, um, then after two thirds of that distance, you would reach the International Space Station. So that means that instead of driving to Las Vegas, after two thirds of the distance, you could already be on, at the station. And even more drastically, you know, to get into space, after 10 minutes in a rocket, you're in zero gravity and you're already in space. Whereas when you consider you know, taking your car from Sayak to wherever after 10 minutes, you're probably just stuck in traffic. So space is not something which is far away, it's very close. It's really all around us. 
And as a matter of fact, we are in space. We are astronauts of a spaceship, Earth, as Buckminster Fuller coined it so nicely. I'd like to introduce you a little bit to this um, very specific environment before I start showing projects. And the uh, space station is the only current uh, station orbiting. The Chinese station had to be deorbited. And it's an international, the ISS is an international project of uh, 16 different nations and organizations. And I think it's one of the greatest also political and societal achievements apart from that one can conduct science in there. It has been orbiting or has been in place and crewed since 1998. And it's a soccer field size um, object. It um, is um, the energy needed is all harvested uh, through the sun. So it has big um, solar arrays. Here, uh, here are some radiators, and it's a um, it's a fusion between uh, Russian um, and uh, international uh, modules. So it's but it's still uh, a paradigm of the uh, we would call it man in a can. So it's a um, very modular tin can uh, approach. But it's in, in microgravity, and microgravity for architects is especially interesting and because suddenly you, you are in, a, in an environment which you might only know from diving, scuba diving, or any kind of free diving, um, where all the directions are the same. So um, top, bottom, right, left, they feel the same, you're floating. And suddenly, whatever you've learned about chairs and beds and, and um, you know, the, the, the furniture we, you know, use in architecture um, to place in our apartments or habitats, uh, that actually that this is completely obsolete. So whatever you've learned, any kind of standards, you have to rethink anew. Because what happens in microgravity is that you're without gravity. Your body is different. It looks approximately like this. And, um, and so you also... This is the point where it becomes difficult to stand behind the podium. So also your visual cone is slightly um, shifted, and so one has to think about how we perceive space and how we move in space. But I'll show you a, a video, um, um, and Sunita Williams, former commander of the uh, space station, um, she is explaining quite well, and so you can take a close look on how she moves, how she also fixes herself in position because microgravity is this endless floating state. Hello, I'm Sunny Williams. I'm up here on the International Space Station. So this is Node 2. This is a really cool module. Um, of course, most of these modules, you'll see they have four sides. Uh, and they're put together. That way we could sort of walk, work on a flat plane, either a wall, a floor, another wall, or the ceiling. But, you know, again, all you have to do is turn yourself and your reference changes. The reason I'm bringing that up is because this is where four out of six of us sleep. And so people always ask about sleeping in space. Do you lie down? Are you in a bed? Um, not really, because it doesn't matter. You don't really have the sensation of lying down. You just sit in your sleeping bag. So here's one sleep station right here. I'm going in right now. You can follow me if you want. So I'm inside. It's sort of like a little phone booth. in the U.S. laboratory. Again, this is a laboratory with science experience on all of the walls here, all sorts of stuff that we do. Um, and one of the things we also do is we exercise. We have some exercise equipment on board the space station. Um, we need to do that because we lose bone density and muscle mass while we're up here, and that's a result of not having to fight against gravity. So how we keep ourselves in shape are with a bike, a treadmill, and a weightlifting machine. This is the bike. You notice the clip pedals. So all you need to do is actually clip your feet in, and then you can start pedaling. You don't need a seat. 
because you don't sit down. Actually, I haven't sat down for six months now, so you don't need any any type of seat. Just make sure you're you're held in with your pedals. So you can see that uh, this environment is quite different and it's quite exciting to design for it. What is also uh, quite uh, uh, exciting in that sense is um, thinking about um, extravehicular activities, so-called EVAs. And um, I marked a couple of places here. Uh, you see here, so you can get really a feeling of the extremes of this environment. So you're inside, you have maybe, um, you know, a temperate climate, but outside, this is, you're in a vacuum. There is um, uh, 250 degrees, um, or um, I think it's uh, over 400 degrees Fahrenheit in the, in the sun, and then over minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit in the shadow, because there's, it's all vacuum. And, um, and there's no atmosphere around it. So you really have to modulate temperatures and, and look for the right materials. So, um, and, um, and when you are outside of the, of the space station, um, then it's also, of course, specifically dangerous because once you float away, you're gone, unless you have pro a pro you know, propellant to bring you back to the... Um, to the place where you left. So what astronauts do is they tether themselves. And uh, let me see. Here you can see some of the tethers. And I really like this, um, this perspective from the astronaut's helmet, actually, because you can really get a feeling. And you just have to imagine that you're circling with um, 28,000 kilometers per hour around the Earth. And, um, and around you is um, just the, the vast universe. So this is the kind of environment, the extreme environment one has to um, put up with. This is an interesting detail. You see that the astronaut here has a manual of what to do, when to do on the, on the arm. So where can we find these kind of extreme environments to test equipment and to prepare for space travel? Uh, one option is the Antarctic, because the Antarctic um, is um, very cold, it's very isolated, it's very remote, it's a desert like Mars, it has uh, strong winds uh, like Mars, and it has temperatures very close to Mars. So um, it has approximately minus 100 um, degrees Fahrenheit or even, um, you know, below. And that is quite equivalent to what we can uh, see on Mars at the equatorial uh, plane. So one of our projects um, is about building a greenhouse facility. We work with... Um, well, each project has a specific focus. So this is a greenhouse. Uh, we work together with the German uh, Aerospace Center and uh, 12 other international and European partners. And it's um, a very specific uh, system. It's, in the, uh, it's still in the Antarctic, um, close to the German Neumeyer station, which is on the shelf ice. and. Um, it's a, it's, it was quite successful, so the, it's going to run two, two more years. It just ran the last winter. Why do we need that? It's a, it's a test bed uh, for future Moon and Mars missions to see whether we can produce vegetables or grow food um, in a soilless manner in an aer with an aeroponic system. So it's a very technical facility. Um, as Liquifer Systems Group, we have uh, engineers who worked on uh, requirements and interface phases, um, and um, we worked on the laboratory, the service section, which is here, um, and then also on the um, documentation parts. So it's a 14-partner project. It's um, two years of developing just this system, um, and. Um, it com it's quite a complex um, overall structure. It has a plant trace, so the roots grow in these uh, uh, 
trays. They grow in darkness, they are soilless, and they just get sprayed with nutrition solution every 10 minutes. These are specific lighting arrays because the light makes the plant uh, grow. And um, this is the nutrition delivery system, uh, which you can see it feeds every tray. And um, we also have the air management system, which sucks the air from the outside, which is quite cold. Um, it's at 20 degrees Celsius, uh, or four, sorry, it's a 60 degree Celsius difference between the inside and the outside. Um, but it's a, a semi-closed uh, loop system. So it's really going towards full, uh, full uh, closed loop systems. We also have an experiment for the International uh, Space Station. It's a so-called payload rack uh, where tomatoes and lettuce is grown. In general, we uh, grew um, lots of different um, types, um, lettuce, um, uh, Swiss chard, uh, special spicy uh, rocket salad, uh, spinach, tomatoes, sweet pepper, cucumbers, radish, strawberries we tried, but it was very difficult with pollination. So um, uh, it, it grew, but we couldn't harvest it. So this is the other thing. Through these projects, we can really find out what is, is possible, where we have to develop further, and how we can uh, get um, really prepared, well prepared for future missions uh, to the moon or Mars. Here you can see um, my two business partners, um, um, the lady, Waltraud Hoheneder. Uh, she's also an architect and a product designer, and we studied together, and uh, René Watzlawiczek, uh, he's also an architect, and then in the um, background is the, uh, one of the engineers from the German Aerospace Center. This is the greenhouse uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, still um, grow, growing stuff in the Antarctic. Uh, so you see the, 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 the trays, um, you see here the young plants, and uh, when you would you know, lift the lid, the, you would only see the, the roots. It's a, it's a system which uh, doesn't need a lot of uh, mass. And it's uh, on a microbial basis uh, quite controlled. This is Paul Zabel. He was there for a whole winter. And uh, even when it was um, super cold outside, minus 100 Fahrenheit, he was going to the greenhouse to harvest. And so you see that in between it looked like a little jungle. And of course, for in, in these isolated um, uh, environments, it's also important uh, to um, have something uh, which grows, which where the environment changes uh, through the plants, through the, through the different stages the plants uh, go through. And um, also, it's a, it's, a, it's a space to hang out because the, the cucumbers, for example, you know, they, they blossom quite nicely, also the strawberries. So it's, um, it was, I was saying in the beginning, quite successful, so they are now um, funding uh, the next two years too. So this is growing food. A completely different matter is growing buildings. Um, it's a, another project, so we're pursuing a path, um, a work path in the area of space exploration, but also in uh, biologic, biology uh, and integrating biological systems uh, into architecture. This project uh, was called Growing as Building, um, and it's about investigating growth principles uh, and translating them into, a, I would say, prototypical <coughs> architecture or some kind of concepts which are before architecture. We investigated a lot of different um, themes. One was um, the, the slime mold. Uh, which uh, has been investigated before, but we always try to look at what's the status quo and how we can um, go beyond the state of the art. That is also part of um, research, uh, the research methodology. So here we try to make the slime mold uh, as a co-designer, um, co-designing with us on uh, existing structures. These are just um, exemplary models. Um, how to connect, because there's a certain intelligence to this slime mold finding path, how to connect uh, different parts of um, buildings.
another part was um, material systems. Here uh, we looked into mycelium, and back then it was a time when at the same time um, the, at the MoMA in New York there was a mycelium brick um, tower built up, but we were not interested in growing mycelium bricks, but we were more interested in really looking into integrated um, material systems, which means that we looked at um, the, the what, what does the mycelium do? It's the, basically, um, it's, it's the mushroom, uh, so the mushroom is the fruiting body and everything below earth within, in the soil which connects the different fruiting bodies, that is the mycelium. So, and, uh, and, we, and, what, and the mycelium eats cellulose. So here we uh, investigated on how, to which extent, when we use cotton structures for membranes, um, or, you know, architectural uh, membranes, um, if the uh, mycelium does change the structural capacities, the membranes are only only work with tensile forces. So um, we try to also introduce um, or try to change the structure so that actually from a hanging membrane you can create an arch through the stabilization of the mycelium, which became integrated into the cotton membrane. Another uh, experiment, so there were different paths we were pursuing, uh, was um, a 3D printers, different types of printers. Um, they were uh, mobile printers because the idea was with growing as a building to create the self-growing house so that you can have a printer, you take it under your arm, you go somewhere, you set it up, and then um, you can um, you just print your house. So this was a a hacked uh, a maker bot with a larger printing volume. And uh, we made some experiments where you could actually see that um, the, so on the right hand side is the 3D model, on the left hand side is the, um, the, the printed um, specimen or the printed model. Um, th that for using one material you can create very different structural properties from um, structurally solid and dense to um, like this kind of textile-like, uh, very fragile part. We also looked into uh, what kind of materials could we um, create, which could be used, which could be local. Uh, what is, what is, where, where can we find? Is there a material which can be found? everywhere. And um, we worked on this project again with a lot of biologists, microbiologists, eco ecologists, plant biologists. Um, and um, and uh, so the microbiologist, she was always creating these recipes for the mycelium, but also for, the, for this printer material here, the calcium carbonate based, um, to, um, which we then um, experimented with, and then she fine-tuned it again. So there was, we had a little lab set up at the University of Applied Arts where we all worked together, architects and scientists, biologists. So here it was the idea that this is again a mobile printer. Um, it's a, a printer which uh, can also twist the, the printing nozzle here, and where we can use the um, the calcium carb carbonate, which is found in bones everywhere, um, basically uh, mixed with um, um, with um, vinegar and alcohol um, to um, uh, to create the right composition. As part of this whole um, project, we investigated bioreactors. That was at the beginning more a side issue, but when the biologists started experimenting with these uh, three materials, calcium carbonate, vinegar, and, uh, and alcohol, they found out that actually while um, mixing it together, it creates uh, carbon dioxide. And so this um, is um, something you don't want to do when you look into a more ecological um, approach for buildings or you know, future buildings. And, um, and so part of the, the bio, so the bioreactor then became part of the loop where uh, one could actually, which could, end, so the bioreactor took up the CO2 and created, uh, turns, uh, formed it into biomass and, and oxygen. The next 
project just directly connecting to that by chance is the living architecture project and that is interesting because that's a, it's a three in one uh, bioreactor comprising a microbial fuel cell which produces energy and polishes water so we can clean gray water whatever we use in the kitchen for example uh, with it, um, and it has a photobioreactor connected to it, which basically supplies the food to the synthetic microbial consortia. That is, um, um, especially on the European side, a very interesting topic because it's uh, about genetically modified organisms and fine-tuning the organisms in that sense that they really can um, work better for us. Um, and um, take up the, um, um, or recover the, the resource of phosphate in our example, but they can do many more things. Um, and um, so we can, you know, use it as a nutrition um, solution for our, our plants again. So with this, um, we are currently uh, building this wall. You see it's not, uh, not filled yet. It's a couple of weeks back. We're going to in inoculate it, so put all the, the different specimen in there. That's a quite the, the diagram how it works. Um, it's a, it, so each of these uh, experimental boxes are comprising these three different bioreactors with the synthetic um, microbial consortia and wild type uh, microbes. And the aim is really to change the way we, um, we create um, um, or we deal with our waste to have waste to see waste as a valuable resource. So this is a, it's a very, it's not the final version. So you see it has a couple of flaws from the animation point of view, but it's really there to, um, we would like to show that the invisible parts of our building installations, that they actually can be transformed and so we can recover uh, you know, water from uh, urine, as they do on space station actually, and also uh, retrieve the phosphate and um, polish in general the water that we can really, um, the gray water, so that we can reuse it and we also decentralize the, um, uh, the, the way we deal with uh, waste. And all this comes together under the umbrella of a concept we have been pursuing since um, a couple of years already, which is uh, the city as a spaceship. One of the co-founders, Susmita Mohanty, she's from India, lives in um, Bangalore, but has lived in Bombay before. So she created this kind of vision that cities can be like spaceships. Because what, um, what is a spaceship? A spaceship ideally is a kind of biosphere where uh, all resources are recycled um, and are kept in a loop uh, where we recycle also other um, uh, materials and um, it's a, a lot about self-sufficiency. So this is the, the over, um, well, overarching, I would say, concept we are trying to pursue with our uh, projects. For this, we work together with a lot of different partners uh, from different <coughs> research institutions all over Europe mainly, but also internationally. And, um, and we have to, um, to also learn um, their terminology, their lingo. We have to, uh, here you see uh, one of our other uh, um, team members, uh, Molly Hogel. Um, in the, so we are here in the lab uh, building microbial fuel cells, so we really have to learn um, to work in a lab or to do simple things so we, have a create a, so we can create a better understanding of what we are actually doing. This is another picture that is um, here we are on the boat with uh, COMEX. It's a company which was uh, founded by the chief engineer of Jacques Cousteau. Uh, for they build underwater habitats, but we run also um, moon and Mars simulations with them, and um, and so it's we also have to know about operations on a boat and and diving, and and so on. So this is really something which is necessary to understand better what we are doing. 
With all our projects, all together, each project focuses on specific topics, but, um, but we, we're trying to somehow fulfill our, um, our goal, our mission, to create different elements, to work on different elements for a lunar or Martian base. Um, you saw the greenhouse project. Uh, I'll introduce you to, to the first base habitat, um, um, the she um, uh, deployable habitat. Um, we have been also working for the European Space Agency on a concept rover, uh, a pressurized rover, like a caravan, a mobile research vehicle, um, and also on robotic vehicles and on EVA, extravehicular activity um, systems and tools, especially tools. Uh, we did a lot of simulator studies. Um, so that is an artif a building where you can, in an artificial environment, simulate you're on, on moon or Mars and test equipment there. But, and more recently, we have been pursuing um, 3D, different methods of 3D printing, um, well, biomimetics we've been doing for a long time, when also looking at ISRU, that stands for in situ resource utilization. This is the, um, so the, the first base probably when you go to space, um, either on moon or Mars, um, you might have a very small um, habitat. Um, we built a prototype, a test bed for Earth to be tested. Um, in, simul uh, in simulations um, to train astronauts for future missions. It's the SHE habitat, self-deployable habitat for extreme environments. And the idea was that it could also um, function as remote research bases in Antarctica or um, after as a high-tech unit um, uh, after uh, for uh, disaster relief. Uh, you see again, it's a a multi-partner project under the lead of the was under the lead of the International Space University, and we were the, the in charge of all the technical uh, coordin coordination and um, also the the design, um, the envelope design and the interior. So it's a it's a habitat that um, has. Um, a, 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 I would say a size of um, 28 square meters. Um, that is, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I can recall it, I think 400 square foot or so. So it's quite, uh, that is when it's deployed and it's uh, half the size, it's the size of a shipping container when it's um, stowed. That is to, be able to be transported not only um, on land or by air, so on terrestrial grounds, but also it could fit into one of uh, the heavy lift launchers, for example, the Falcon Heavy by SpaceX. It actually two back to back could fit into one um, into one rocket. So this was important to us because when you simulate you're on Mars or on the moon, you don't want to simulate in a container, which is, it is so often done, but simulate in a space, which is more realistic to the actual mission. So this is an animation of the, um, uh, of the deployment um, choreography, I would say. So the, the habitat has uh, six uh, petals and um, four larger ones, two smaller ones. And it's envisioned and they also do open um, uh, automatically. Um, this is the, the interior. So the interesting thing is if, if the outside, the, the envelope, the shell is collapsible, deployable, then the inside has to be transformable as well. Important is the, uh, the, the private space. It's a habitat for two crew members for a mission length of uh, two to three weeks. But of course, you can connect uh, a couple of these habitats so you can ex you know, in, um, extend the, the crew. Or, make it to four or six people. There's a, a working zone, and um, of, there's a galley, which is a, a small kitchen. And in the middle is the so-called um, uh, 
galley table, the communal zone, which um, is also important that there is a, a private zone, a communal zone, and then because of the, the shape and the envelope, the overall design, that all the different parts without having doors or uh, they are quite, um, you know, spatially um, on their own in that sense that you are not, you know, it's, the, the problem often is in these uh, missions that they, it becomes too crowded or you have the feeling you have no space uh, left anymore, but through, these, um, through the design you actually can have these different uh, spaces and also get away from the crew. And this is the so-called suit port. That is a, a double door, you step into that suit and it's a quite common concept and interface for especially Mars exploration, but also uh, lunar exploration, because you don't want to get the outside environment inside, or you don't want to contaminate with your own biology microbes we are carrying around all the time the Martian surface, because when we go to Mars, we want to find alien life, not the life we brought with us. So this is, um, these are these uh, pristine pictures, you know, architecture pictures you do after your work is finished. Um, you see the crew quarters, uh, the galley table, uh, and then uh, you go into a simulation mission. This was um, the, the she habitat as part of another uh, project, Moonwalk, um, and this is the Mars mission of the Moonwalk project, the Mars mission simulation. Moonwalk was about uh, the interaction of astronauts and small helper rovers and testing these in different environments. And then you suddenly see, as, as it is often the case, people move into the habitat, they start using it. This is local mission control, this is Capcom. With the with direct link to main mission control uh, in Saventem in Belgium, and um, and and so these people they speak with the simulation astronaut astronauts, and he was completely in charge of the overall procedures. Here are the medical doctors. Before each simulation astronaut went into simulation, you had to be checked uh, if your blood pressure is low enough because the suit is very heavy, it was very hot outside. Um, and um, here you see this is a simulation, a simulator of that uh, suit port. So it's not uh, the real thing, it's just to train the procedures and to see if that could work. And then you dock away, here's a sirene in the suit. Um, you dock away and you um, have a specific set of, of procedures and a manual, and here's a, actually an, an, an interface. You are also um, directly connected to Capcom, um, and you start investigating the unknown terrain. Then uh, the astrobiologists, they already used the workspace for an astrobiology laboratory, and here you see how the rover is steered with uh, gesture control. And then we also used it in different environments because when the suit is very heavy that you can, when you plan for these missions, you actually have to consider that probably with this heavy suit you cannot go uh, onto steep um, uh, hills or surfaces, but you have to probably have a, a rover or, or um, uh, yeah, something else, another vehicle to explore first. And these are the, the circumstances where we have ourselves opportunities to also, again, familiarize, but also become simulation astronauts. And this is the underwater simulation. That was interesting because it uh, represented a very good, um, well, on two levels. First, it was under 1.6 gravity, so all the equipment was... Um, set so that you, it, it felt like as if you would walk on the moon. And secondly, that being in a spacesuit, uh, not me, that's somebody else, uh, in underwater is really, uh, it really feels very close to, to, to being in a real uh, situation because you cannot just, you know, walk out or take off the suit. It's all, you know, there's a, a, a lot of procedures uh, coming with it, and it's it's quite it's it's well, it's not as dangerous as being in outer space, but it also has its um, um, its tricky parts, I would say. The 
um, this is the, the, the Lava Hive uh, project. So this is, you know, when we are establishing basis for longer habitation, for longer duration. That is the, the third prize winning project of the 3D NASA printed, NASA 3D printed habitat challenge, which uh, actually we uh, collaborated with the European Space Agency on that. It's, um, it takes on, the task was to develop a um, process where the material um, on Mars can be used for 3D printing. So the, um, the ESA suggested a lava casting process where we melt the sand into a sort of lava and cast it. In addition, um, this was also a concept where we suggested to reuse the re-entry capsules and other parts. And you see again here the suit ports. Uh, this is the habitat. This is the laboratory greenhouse. And it's, um, it's, it's an, an example for a, um, for a layout which can also be extended. Inside you have um, a couple of different um, um, connectors um, and habitat spaces. This is the dining area, but you always have to design the overall layout in a way that you can actually also, if one uh, part doesn't function anymore or there's a fire, that you can close it off and still be safe in the rest of it. This is the astrobiology laboratory, which will be an important part on Mars with the autoclave system and getting samples in and out and investigating it in between. And what you can also see uh, as part, so this is a, a static uh, base basically and as part of real exploration, you probably also want to have a, a mobile research laboratory. This was a larger project, one of the earlier ones we did for the European Space Agency, where we, with our engineers, really designed through a lot of detail uh, this kind uh, of um, research um, vehicle. It's slightly smaller than the Xi habitat, uh, but it's also for two people, duration for 20 days, and has a, a similar mass. Um, it can be used well either on the moon or on Mars. The, the, dif the differentiation is not that uh, big. And here, for the first time, what we actually did was um, we um, we started off with the with a transformative uh, space because this is really small. You see, there's the the suit board, the life support systems. Um, here, actually, it's a, it's just it's like a camping trip. You sleep here in a more safer part because you want to protect yourself from radiation. Um, there's another sample airlock um, and the galley. So these are the, the basic functions are um, enclosed here. And basically the, the, the interior space only comprises of two um, uh, furniture pieces, two cockpit seats and they are transformable and they revolve around um, this circle and they can be you know, work spaces um, or work desks places or recliners, um, you can watch movies and then this opens up and is, this is as the door to the crew quarters and at the same time the, the dining table. The, uh, so when we look at, at exploration, this is now I'm going to introduce you to Regolite. This is an interesting project because, again, it looks at in situ resource utilization. It's a special process. It's sintering. And sintering is very, I think it's very cool because you only need the sun and the sand. You don't need chemical binders. And, uh, and especially on the moon, where we have no atmosphere, we have very strong radiation, lots, lo a lot more than we have on Mars, actually, where we also have to protect ourselves through these thick structures from radiation. But especially on the moon, this, makes, um, uh, this is very vital to build these structures. So we can, through an additive layer manufacturing process, sinter the lunar uh, soil to create 
to, to have uh, building materials, uh, building elements. So we, um, we chose in with building elements with interlocking capacity. So it was a lot about designing the geometry, geometry and also for a surface battlement because the moon sand can be very intrusive and it's, um, it's also quite dangerous. So you really want to try to not stir up too much dust in that sense, but also to create um, habitats and shelters. We did um, three different printing campaigns. This is one campaign. We worked with the German Aerospace Center. Again, they have this big um, laboratories and the solar oven. This is um, an automated and with, um, with an engineering, Belgium engineering company, company uh, Space Application Services. And, and they designed the, the automated uh, printing table, uh, which um, you see the, the feeder is here and there's layer by layer, the sand is uh, deposited and then the, um, the solar beam, so this is, uh, there's lots of xenon lights are in the back here and the, 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 this, the beam is concentrated and, um, and so basically layer by layer is glued on top of each other, that's the process. We used um, a special simulation sand which represents, which is a, a synthetic lunar soil, so it's made on Earth but it comprises very similar characteristics. And this is what you get. What you also can see is that research, you know, at the end you might get a, a product, you are definitely wiser, uh, but you might not get the, the, what you really thought you could achieve. So um, you see that there's, it's still bulging and, um, and so there's still a lot of development work to be done. We also did another test in a, in a very big uh, printer. Uh, we called it mobile printer. It's not mobile, but it, the, the concept was to, that it could be, um, that th this typology, which is slightly different with a Fresnel lens, could be set on a lunar uh, rover. Um, and, and so the, the mirror would move, automated and then the sand could be deposited um, as shown here. So not the table is moving, but the, uh, uh, the um, Fresnel lens which concentrates the solar light is moving. So that's an, another option and it could be, it's, a, it's an option which you can put on a rover. And then lastly, we also did a campaign in a vacuum chamber because on the moon we have vacuum. And it's not easy to, while well, what might work on Earth does not automatically work on the moon. And here uh, we really, um, you know, this is what we in the next steps need to uh, develop further, uh, get a good integrated sample from the vacuum chamber. So we've been working with engineers um, and, um, and scientists, material scientists, mostly on this project. And our task was to design in an iterative process the, the interlocking elements. Um, this is a um, dodecahedron, so it's a, a space filler element. And um, this, was, this is a final element. You see it has quite obtuse angles that comes from the, from the findings from the actual printing that we can't have uh, sharp angles, but we have to have um, more obtuse angles. And this geometry also allows to actually place in, in all directions equally X, Y, Z these elements and put larger uh, chunks together so that we can create um, larger parts at once. So a base could be, you see that here, could be developed um, as follows. Uh, also with some pressurized uh, volumes and then for radiation shielding different layers of sintered and non-sintered regolith. So this could be uh, one part of it and of course you can imagine that you can just extend the space uh, a lot. There's a, a solar um, a power station in the back. You see some mobile elements again. And the I idea is to have everything automatically, robotically sintered, and then um, bring in the, the pressurized volumes, which could be also, which are partly inflatable and partly rigid. Also for the launch pad, 
um, you would need so that the sand doesn't get into, you know, close to the base, you will need some, um, some protecting apron. So this is then what uh, a future lunar base uh, could look like. Um, some is still in, under construction. But right now, we are not, um, not there yet. Soon, but not there yet. What is currently right now happening, and we are a part of it, is um, the gateway. That is the next space station. It's supposed to circle in this orbit around the moon. This is the Earth. This is the moon. Um, and have uh, always visibility to Earth. Um, and at the same time allow, because it's called gateway, lunar orbital platform, be a kind of gateway to the surface of the moon and further also to Mars. And um, we were contracted by Airbus, who's a, a space station partner, so we're working with all the space station partners together to design the interior of this IHAB. Um, so you see, in comparison to space station, this is small. It's for political reasons. It's it's you know it's it's on here that uh, not to scare everybody away from investments. Say okay, next thing we do something smaller, but further away in deep space, where we are not uh, protected from radiation through the Van Allen belt. So there are a lot of more uh, challenges. Also, um, the missions should be shorter, four people. Uh, for a month, and in between, there are robotic systems tending the station. So I can't show uh, much more um, than that, this, but this is not uh, our image. That's from, uh, I think, from Lockheed Martin or so. Um, it's, a, that it's, it's a very small, um, habitable um, uh, volume, but it's, um, it's quite interesting, and we are currently building on Airbus uh, site a huge one-to-one uh, -one mock up So in September, October, um, we'll have, um, we can show something already. So definitely, um, and with this, I'd, I'd like to end. Um, the stars uh, look different today, but they will even look more different tomorrow. And uh, with this and um, Viennese waltz, uh, I say goodbye. Thank you.